Okay, today we are getting to the last segment in Noah. There are really short episodes, three short episodes in a row, but I think it's important to take a look at each of these issues separately. This one especially today, as we take a look at Noah and science. We're still in Genesis chapter 6 through 10, um, but it's important to look at the scientific and historical aspects to the Noah story. I think it's important in all the Bible uh, narratives, all the ones that are told out of real life. Um, but I think this one, especially because of all the parts of the Bible that appear to be a fairy tale, uh, boy, Genesis 6 through 10, 6 through 8 especially is exhibit A. I mean, Noah is told to build a big boat that will hold his family and all the animals on the earth while God destroys the rest of the earth through a flood. Um, I'm sorry, but no, that that's impossible. That can't happen. It's not scientifically viable. And I'm not joking. It can happen. It's impossible. It's not scientifically viable. I, I kind of worry about people older than nine who accept this story too easily. Um, now, let me be, be very clear. I do accept it at face value. It did happen as written. It did. <laughs> but is it okay to admit that it makes me squirm a little? Right? So if it's ever made you squirm, you're hopefully in good company. Hopefully I'm good company. Um, and, and no, I am not afraid that somebody is going to come along and disprove this scientifically. It has already been disproven scientifically, and I believe them. All the animals in the world cannot fit on one boat. And even if you could physically fit them in there, you're not going to get them from all over the earth to come onto a boat. You can't gather them from the far corners of Australia and the Americas and Africa and even Antarctica. You can't do that. It's physically impossible to do. But it happened. It's also physically impossible for a dead body to raise from the dead to life again after three days. But that happened too. It's also impossible for a donkey to talk, but that happened too. The Bible is filled with impossibilities that happened. So if one of our foundational principles is that good science and good theology are good friends, how can they possibly be good friends in this story? The only way good science and good theology can be good friends in this story is the first four words that we looked at in this entire study, the first four words in the entire Bible. In the beginning, God. That's why we had to start there. That's why we spent so much time with that. That's why I told you, if you can, if you can handle the first four words of the Bible, you can handle the rest of it. If there is, in fact, a God who created everything, including time and space itself, then he has the ability to step into time and space and to make things happen that cannot happen. He made the rules. He gets to suspend them. This is why, biblically, faith begins, just like the Bible begins, with the existence of God. Let me jump way ahead into the New Testament, one of my favorite all-time verses, because it lays this out so importantly for us. Hebrews 11, verse 6 says this, And without faith it is impossible to please God. That's the part that we usually quote in this verse. We usually forget this middle part, but I love this middle part. That's what matters here. Take a look at this. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. We like the without faith it's impossible to please God. We like the rewarding those who earnestly seek him. We sometimes go too quickly over the middle part in order to, to come to God, you have to believe that God exists. You have to believe in the beginning God. And when you do, then the rest of the things come much more easily. They're still not simple. They're still not overly easy. They're still challenging. They're still complex. They're still messy. But they can then be believed once you begin with that. And here's what's interesting. The writer of the Hebrews begins, the, you know, Hebrews 11 starts you know, early on into the chapter with this verse, without faith it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. The very next verse, after establishing you have to believe God exists, the very next verse is this. By faith, Noah, when warned about the things not seen in Holy Field, built an ark to save his family. By faith, by his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. I don't think it's coincidental 
that in what we call the faith chapter, Hebrews 11, when it, the, when, when it states, in order to believe this, you've got to believe that God exists, that then immediately it tells the story of Noah. Because it may be, of all the stories in the Old Testament, it may be the one that most requires you to believe in an all-powerful God, God who can pull this off, because Noah couldn't have pulled this off. Noah and his sons and their families could not have pulled this off. This is not the great accomplishment of Noah. This is what God did. Is it still confusing? Is it still messy? Does it still let me leave me squirming when I tell people I believe about it sometimes? Yeah, I'm going to admit that. It, it's, it's weird. It's weird. But you know what? I don't want a toothless God, a miracle-free God, a, a God who's only there to teach us good thoughts about ourselves and each other. I want good thoughts about ourselves and each other, but I don't want just that. I don't want to a God who, where I have to pretend that miracles are real. I want a God who does such crazy stuff that it challenges every fiber of my being to believe it. And this story does that. This story challenges every fiber of my being to believe it. But I do. I believe it happened because I believe in the beginning God. Because I believe God can suspend the rules of nature because he's the one who created the rules of nature. The miracles in the Bible are real. They did happen. I'm comfortable with most of the, the miracles, quite frankly. Jesus healing blind eyes. Oh, yeah, he can do that. You know, I, I, I still expect to see that sometime today when we pray. But I've got to be okay with being uncomfortable with some of the miracles. And this is probably number one on my discomfort list. <laughs> because uh, you look at it and go, it's, it's, it's just impossible. And you know what? Yes, it is impossible. It can't happen, but it did. All of that to say this. The Noah story cannot be understood by natural means. And I think this is where... This story then is where almost all of our fundamental starting principles for Bible study come together that we established at the beginning of this series. One, this is God's story, not ours. Two, we take literal stories literally. So if it's told literally, it is. It's time stamped all over the place, as we talked about last week. It actually happened. Thirdly, we're not going to expect naturalistic explanations for miracles. Boy, this one is sure big for that. And good science and good theology are good friends. That's the challenging one. But it does make sense if you accept the previous three. This is God's story, so he can do it. He told it literally, we accept it literally. And we don't have to look for a naturalistic scientific explanation for it because God can and did suspend the laws of nature for this. So that's what's happening here. So what's going on here? There, there's, there's a whole subgenre of Christians who are absolutely insistent that this story has to be taken uh, in it with natural that there have to be naturalistic explanations for how the story occurred. Uh, I agree with them that the story absolutely occurred. Absolutely agree with it. A boat got built. The animals all got on it. The, the, the time stamps in the Bible happened. I absolutely believe it. But there's a, a, a group of Christians who are absolutely convinced that the, our faith will fall apart if they can't come up with a naturalistic explanation for it. As an example for that, and I'm not one who criticizes other ministers, but this is one of those things where I, I kind of have to offer my take on this because there's no way to get through the Noah story without offering my take on it. Um, a year or so ago, my wife and I, Shelley, went to the Ark Encounter in Kentucky. This is a picture of us in front of it. There's no way to understand the scale of it. The thing is, it, it, it's, like, uh, it's like a skyscraper on its side. The thing is massive. If you've ever been you know, next to a cruise ship. It's it's that feeling, only it's sitting on the land. It's just ridiculously huge. Here's a picture of it from a bit of a distance. Again, the scale of it, you simply cannot comprehend from here. It is just a monster of a ship. And they built the thing, and you can go in, and you can go through it, and you can see, I mean, display after display after display, and movie after movie, and illustration after illustration, and cages, and, and pots, and water, and all of these fascinating explanations of how they might have preserved the water, how they might have gotten the animals on, how they might have built the whole thing. It's, so much of it is fascinating. But there's a whole subsection of it where they insist on, again, a naturalistic explanation for how every animal fit on there by talking about some of the language that it was animals according to their kinds. So that, for instance, if I get this, if I get this wrong, I apologize, but this is my best remembrance of it. For instance, there's like one bear on there because it's of the family of bears. 
and then the family of bears split off from all of those. That's right. And so there's one animal from the deer family on there and all the different types of deer. And there's one animal from the cockroach family. And now there's thousands of types of cockroaches and they all came from the one, which seems weird to me because that presupposes evolution. Now, we talked about this earlier, that presupposes microevolution, evolution within within types and kinds and not macroevolution switching from one kind to the other. So there's a there's a huge part of that that I have great great agreement with. But as I was walking through it, most of it just kind of struck me flat. Like why are we going through all of this time and, and expense and energy to explain something that quite frankly is not scientifically explainable? And there's no need to explain it scientifically. I can just go, God did it. God performed a miracle. It's like trying to come up with a naturalistic explanation for the resurrection of Jesus. There is no naturalistic explanation for the resurrection of Jesus. The whole point of it is that it's not natural, that it is supernatural, that it is miraculous. That's the whole point. So if you are one who loves the Ark Encounter and all that, God bless you. Uh, you know, you're my brother or sister in Christ. We'll see each other in heaven and we'll have a good laugh over this when we both find out ways we, that, we, that we were wrong. Um, but I'm, I'm not in that camp. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't need naturalistic explanations. And I think a lot of our attempts to do naturalistic explanations, quite frankly, sometimes make us end up looking foolish in front of scientists. I think trying to explain scientifically the arc and how that all happened is less credible to the non-believing scientist than to say, I believe in a supernatural God who did this. I think that's a more reasonable explanation to the typical scientist. Is it the only explanation? No. Is it absolutely the right one for sure? I don't know. But to me, it makes more sense. That's where I stand. If you stand in a different place, God bless you. Again, truly best friend. Okay. Now, what I want to do is I want to close with four specific what about questions. And these are things that are often brought up in the ARC story uh, that people have legitimate questions about. And I think that we need to take a quick look at anyway. First of all, what about the dinosaurs? Uh, dinosaurs did exist on this earth. They did exist. There's too much evidence to deny the existence of dinosaurs. Um, so the question is, well, then did Noah take the dinosaurs on the ark with him? And if so, how? Um, remember way, way back when I talked about, you know, the age of the universe and how we, some of the ways that we can possibly understand that in a six day timeline for creation. And I said, if you were to land on the earth, if you were to go back in time and land on the, in the Garden of Eden five minutes after creation, you wouldn't see five minute old infants lying on the ground helpless. You would see two human adults who appear to be maybe in their 20s, even though they had just existed for five minutes because they were created that way. And you'd look around and you'd see full grown trees and you'd go, those trees must have been there for hundreds of years, when in fact, no, they've been there for five minutes too. Uh, because you had to create creation if creation was created all in one instance in one moment in one snap of the fingers by god on the sixth day which god is fully capable of doing then they had to you, you had to create different things at different stages of their development in order for the balance to happen you can't have them all in their infancy at one time right so i don't have any problem with the idea that there are many things that are dated uh hundreds of thousands, millions, even billions of years old, that had to be set in place in order for the creation to work the way it did, even if God did it in an instant. Um, but with dinosaur bones, it's a little different because I look at it and I think, okay, all of that I get, you know, these stars where the light has taken billions of years co to come to us, absolutely scientifically true. You can't discount the reality of that. It's just true. Now, did God in a snap create that and create that six billion years in transition? He has the capability of doing that, and maybe he did. Or maybe he actually let it all develop on the sixth day, and the sixth day is simply an era of history that lasted billions of years. It could be either one of those. I don't know. Some people think that theologically it has to be one or the other. I don't think so. But <laughs> planting dinosaur bones in the desert, if they didn't actually exist, is just plain deception. I the dinosaur bones, that's a different thing to me. So what we do know for sure, we saw last week, when you're faced with things you don't know for sure, start with what you do know for sure. So what about the dinosaurs? What we do know for sure is this, dinosaurs died out long before the ark. Long before humans came along, dinosaurs came. The, the dinosaur age was many, like millions of years pre-human. We know that. Now again, 
did God do that in an instant with all of that development having happened? Maybe. Or did it actually happen that way and day six actually lasted billions of years? I don't know. I just don't know. But no, there were no dinosaurs on the ark. They've been gone long before then. There's a subsection of Christians that believe that dinosaurs are simply dragons, that dragons is just another name for dinosaurs, and that there was an era where dragons existed on the earth a few thousand years ago. I'm just going to call nonsense on that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. It, it it just doesn't work. It doesn't, no, it just doesn't fit. It, it, it's not biblically necessary and it's not scientifically plausible. But so dinosaurs died out long before the ark. They were not on the ark because they were long gone. However that happened, I'll, you can pick and choose from those various ideas or from other ideas that you might know of. So that's the one thing, the dinosaurs. Second thing we'll take a look at is what about what's called the canopy theory. So what is the canopy theory? The canopy theory proposes that the earth was surrounded by a layer of water that burst open to flood the earth. So when in, in Genesis 1, where it says there was water above the sky and water below the sky, there were people who believed that the water above the sky was not clouds as we have today, but that in fact there was a membrane above the earth that you looked up, and when you looked up, there was water like an ocean of water above your head, not clouds, solid water above your head, maybe even with fish in it. I don't know. I don't know what the canopy theory is fully, but I believe there are some in the, who believe in the canopy theory who believe you could look up and see white, great white sharks passing over the earth, okay? And that during the flood, the floodgates of heaven, which are actually referenced in the passage, that the floodgates of heaven are that there were doors and that the membrane was broken and it just, the ocean above the earth flooded the earth. Uh, there are those who believe that's what's called the canopy theory, and it's based on the idea that the water above the earth formed a canopy over the earth, and that this changed the atmosphere. This is why people lived longer, because you didn't have as much direct exposure to sunlight, and all kinds of different things. A whole big subsection of, of interesting theology uh, mixed with interesting science for that. Um, and, and, it's, and, and that's why it took 40 days for all of it to fall to the earth because there was an entire ocean that had to fall to the earth. Uh, and, and that's why the rainbow after the flood was so important because a rainbow hadn't been seen before the flood because if there's, if there's an ocean above the earth, there's no reason for rain, there's no reason for mist, there's no reason for the things that create rainbows. So that was that's a whole, whole theory of things. Um, I, I, I'm just gonna say this, it, it's not biblically or scientifically credible. One, it's not biblically necessary. It, the, the, the tiny little pieces they pick out from the Bible to, to prove that are so tiny and have so many other much more simple rational explanations that they just don't fit. And scientifically, there's just zero credibility to that. Um, and again, I think it comes from the idea that we're trying to look for naturalistic explanations for what are miracles. How was there enough water to flood everything when there isn't enough water only now to cover two thirds of the earth? Oh, it must have come from somewhere else. No. Miracle. In the beginning, God. This is a miraculous thing that God did. So, yeah, I, I don't buy the canopy theory either. And again, if you look at it differently, I'm not mad at you. Uh, that's just my take on it. N another question is this. What about other worldwide flood stories? There's a lot of cynics and skeptics of the Bible that talk about the Epic of Gilgamesh and all kinds of other stories. Almost every ancient religion has a version of a flood story. And so they go, well, it's just you know, some of them are, are older, were written down before this flood story was written down. So it's just, you know, he, somebody just copied Gilgamesh or whatever. So does that, you know, negate or does that uh, diminish the value of the Bible story, the fact that other religions have a flood story as well? No, it doesn't diminish it because since it really happened, we expect other cultures to have a story about it. <laughs> Actual historical events have versions in different places. So because it happened, you would expect other tribes and other places. There are, you know, they have found tribes in the Amazonian jungle. They found tribes in the deepest, darkest jungles of Africa who have, who have flood stories really similar to Noah's Ark. How would they possibly get that? Because it happened, and so it was passed down to them too. Uh, that's all. I, I got no problem with there being other worldwide flood stories from other religions, uh, you know, this one is the, the the most accurate one because it's the God, it's the version that God, the Creator Himself, gave to us, and the others have differences because 
you know, the broken telephone thing, it gets changed in the telling of it as you get further and further away from scripture, but scripture tells it accurately as it happened. So I got no problem with that at all. In fact, I'd be suspect of the story if there weren't other versions of it. A universal flood that actually happened and nobody else knows about it, that would be more problematic than the fact that there's a bunch of other stories about it. And then the final question we'll take a look at before we conclude this one and finally move on next week from Noah is what about regional flood theories? There are some people who believe that this was a local flood. It only happened in their area and not universally. Um, and part of the challenge of that is, uh, one, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says the whole world. Uh, and I believe that. Uh, secondly, it's almost like they misunderstand the properties of water. Uh, before the water receded, the ark landed in the mountains of Ararat. We know where that is. It's an actual place in, in the world, I believe, in northern Turkey. And Mount Ararat, the mountain itself, is over 17,000 feet in elevation. It is the tallest mountain range in that part of the world. And if that mountain is flooded, which it was before the ark landed on it, then everything on earth has to be flooded. Mount Whitney, the highest point in the continental U.S., is only 14,000 and a half, 14.5 thousand feet tall, and Ararat is 17,000. So it's, it's enough water to cover the entire continental United States. Okay, so we know that for an absolute certainty because it landed on Ararat at that height. So here's the thing. The biggest problem with the regional flood theory is that the height of Mount Ararat makes a regional flood impossible. It's hard to believe that a flood that could cover the mountains of Ararat would only cover a portion of the world. It covers the entire world. If, it's, if, it's, if the water is flowing that high, everything is flooded. So that to me, again, is it, it's, is it crazy? How do you get that much water when now we've only got two thirds of it? There's all kinds of unanswered questions. I, I agree with it. This is why I said earlier, this is one of those stories that makes me kind of you know cringy a little bit because it's so weird. But I, do I believe it? Absolutely. Uh, it absolutely happened. I don't believe in the canopy theory. I don't believe in the regional flood theory. It's, it, biblically, it doesn't say so, but also scientifically, it doesn't make any sense. So what's really happening here? Let's just lay it out bottom line, and then we'll be done with the story for now. But I hope you've enjoyed it. I love digging into it. If the Noah story is a metaphor, there are a ton of theological problems that go along with it. It has to be real, theologically. Secondly, if it's real life, then there are a lot of scientific problems with it. It can't happen. You can't gather all the animals in the world on a big boat. It can't happen. So if it's real life, it can't happen, which means it has to be a miracle. But if it's a miracle, why did God need Noah to build a boat? God could have performed a miracle without a boat, without Noah, without any help whatsoever. He created the entire universe in six days by speaking it into existence and by, you know, by, by forming us out of the dust and breathing life into us as human beings. He didn't need us for that. Why would he need us for this? This is a, as big as this is, it's a much smaller event than the creation of the entire universe. And he didn't need us for that. Here's why. Here's the bottom line. And we'll finish with this for today. God performed a massive global miracle through Noah's obedience. That's the only explanation I have that I can live with, quite frankly, for the Noah story. It happened? Did it happen? Yes, it absolutely happened. In time and space on this planet, yes, it actually happened. How could it happen? God performed a massive global miracle, and he needed, he chose to need, he chose to use Noah's obedience in order to make it happen. Why? Because the redemption of mankind and the moving forward, part of the lesson of it for us is not just simply that God can destroy it and start it when he wants to, but that our obedience matters and that our obedience changes things for us and that our obedience is important to God and that when God does great things, he wants to use us in the process of doing them, that what you and I do matters. So yes, somebody had to participate in this, not in order for it to be done. God could have done it without that. But in order for us to get the full lesson today and a deeper understanding of what happened and why and how we go, how we move forward with it, that's why. Massive global miracle. Noah's obedience was central to it. And that's what God did. If you have disagreements with that, 
God bless you. <laughs> I know there's no way you go through this Noah story. Nobody goes through this Noah story and doesn't find some significant disagreements with a whole lot of other Christians. It's just one of those stories. And that's okay. We can disagree. We can see it different ways. We can still love Jesus. We can still love each other. We can still get along. It'll still be great. Okay. That's it. Next week, we finally move away from Noah after three weeks with Noah. Next week, we get to an even, not stranger, but another strange story, the Tower of Babel. And how do we match what the Tower of Babel says about the development of language with what we know anthropologically happened with the development of language? Another interesting one for good science and good theology being good friends. I hope we'll see you next week for that one. It's going to be fun.